So we do move Wendy's little placard like, I don't know, six inches that way. We now call the uh, January 2022 meeting of the Human Rights Commission to order. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. I move to approve the minutes. Is second. there a second? Second. Minutes have been uh, made a motion to approve. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes, approve the minutes. We'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our new members uh, starting their term of service with the New Alm Human Rights Commission, uh, Janelle McCray and Aaron Casola. Casola, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome you aboard. Uh, we'd like to, if you just take a moment to introduce yourself to the commission, uh, and then we'll introduce ourselves to you as well. Yeah, make Hi. sure you talk into the mic. There we go. Hi, I'm Janelle McCray. Do you want to know anything? <laughs> <laughs> I spent many, many years working with folks with disabilities in the residential setting and have since retired. Okay. So I have time to do things like this. <laughs> okay. And Aaron? Hi, I'm Aaron Casola, and I'm fairly a new resident to New Ulm. I moved here approximately a year and a half ago, and I spent previous to that 30 years in Minneapolis and decided it was time for more peace and quiet. And so I uh, have moved here. Um, and about six months ago, I got involved with Turner Hall, and I'm currently a board member there as well. And I run a small business called Ace Abstracting Services that does property searches for title insurance companies. And I have been doing that since 2007. Okay. So Casey, you wanna take an opportunity briefly? My name is Casey McMullen, and um, this is my first year on the Human Rights Commission, and I work over at Jefferson Elementary. And my name is Kristen Springer, and this is this is now my second year on the commission, and I work at the New Old Medical Center. My name is Dan Kolk. I think this is my third year, uh, but I uh, was it four? I was that a so. four? Four. <laughs> uh, time flies, uh, and I uh, work at the Brown County Attorney's Office as an assistant county attorney. I'm Larry Zare. This is my last year on the Human Rights Commission, and I teach up at the college. And at Wendy Ringhofer, also my last year. And I think I, I was going to say how many years you've been in, because that's how I was going to figure mine. But uh, I've been on seven, <laughs> like so seven. Yeah, seven. All right. And I'm a middle school teacher, middle school science teacher in Mankato, but I live here, and my kids go to school in town here as well. My name is Pat Gens. I work at North Central Canada in New Ulm. Uh, this is my third year on the Human Rights Commission. Uh, Katie Dorshner is also a relatively new member. She was at our last meeting. She is ill today, or not COVID, uh, yeah, COVID testing out, whatever. Okay, uh, take a look at our budget report. If you'll notice, for 2021, uh, given the fact that we did not spend as much as we had hoped because of limited, limited availability for some of our events, uh, we had a surplus. We didn't spend our entire report. And if we want to look at the 
at the uh, budget for this coming year, you'll notice that we have uh, almost all of our money still available to us. So that does not require any action. So we'll move forward. Uh, we are going to postpone the events committee report to the end of our meeting. Uh, next, the education committee report. The poster and essay contest deadline was January 15th. Uh, as of right now, we did not have any entries at City Hall. Um, COVID's been very difficult on our poster and essay contest. Any discussion? I would like to move that we just postpone the due date. And I'm gonna own part of this. Uh, it was December and the rest of January here because of the medical situation in my house was a mess. And I usually am on top of calling the schools and reminding the teachers and just putting out reminders to turn it in and none of that got done and that's on me. So I think it would be fair if we would just extend the date on it this year. How long would we like to extend the date? What do you think is fair? Like maybe March. Yeah, I was thinking Does maybe. March give us enough time until I, th the, I think so. The essays and judging and presenting. Yeah, I think that I wouldn't want it sooner. Oh, we than have that. had due dates in in March in the past. So. Mm -hmm. you want, um, I'd, I'd entertain on a motion on that. Yes, I, I would uh, move that we extend the deadline for both the poster and the essay contest uh, until March fifteenth, twenty twenty two. Is there a second to that? I second it. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. We'll extend that. I'll inform uh, Lisa to get something out to the paper and we'll extend that. Uh, Public Relations Committee report, nothing yet. Wendy is the chair of our Public Relations Committee. Any issues of current, right, current human rights issues that we're aware of? Members do receive uh, mailings from the Minnesota Human Rights Commission, uh, so they keep us kind of informed with our emails, uh, aware of that. In the past, we have had some uh, local human rights issues that we've discussed, uh, particularly the graffiti down at the, uh, off the bike path. <laughs> Uh, Dan, any legislative update that you're aware of? Uh, no, not that not that I'm aware of. I did look and I did not did not okay. see anything, at least not pressing. Nothing coming up. With that, we'll move on to our old business, roughly speaking. Uh, in our last meeting, we had some questions about some of the updated policies regarding the New Orleans Police Department from the City Council meeting. So I invite to the uh, microphone Chief Dave Borchert, uh, who has been willing to explain some of these to us as well. Chief, the floor is yours. Right, thank you. Um, as everyone knows, my name is Dave Borker. I'm the Chief of Police for the City of New Ulm. And we had some question last time about some, some policies. Um, so I thought, had some opportunity to, to research some of those concerns that we have and try to address them. So I'm gonna try to do this um, kind of line by line I've had the opportunity of working with Casey. You're able to provide some of the specific questions that you had, so that's what I'm prepared to talk about tonight. Um, you know, there could be other policies, and as far as the policy um, implementation, the city of New Ulm, our policies were extremely outdated. So when we had, you know, we, we did the best we could, but we were we were trying to upgrade them as we went along. We couldn't really keep up with the changes um, with case law, whenever there's a case law change, um, you know, at the even federal level, or even at the state level, and sometimes the local level, whether that's published or unpublished, we, uh, it certainly impacts how we're doing it. We try to learn from others. Um, but trying to really keep up with, with that was very difficult. So we purchased uh, software um, called Lexipol. And essentially that's, we're right in the, the method of changing it right now. So rather than changing our policies, what we're really doing is completely changing our policies. We're starting over. And that's primarily because what we had before, um, it, you know, some of the stuff was very dated. Um, you could kind of tell the era that certain things were incorporated. Um, they used kind of like, um, like a different structure that was 
you know, from the 80s is a little bit different than the 90s. And, and we just really felt it was important for us to start over. So we had gotten, um, the council was very supportive and we got permission to go with Lexapol. So, um, you know, just to kind of educate everybody, um, what we're talking about here are policies, not practices. Now, you know, policies will guide practices, but you know, there, there is a distinction, it's, it is different. Um, and then as far as the order of succession, of course, you know, we certainly hope that no policy is in contrary to the Constitution, but that, you know, the Constitution, United States Con Constitution rules, that's the, that's the primary. Um, then certainly federal law, state law, and then city policies have to be in compliance with that. And that's where I think that's an added benefit with having Lexapol because as changes are happening, if there's a, if there's a law change um, or some case law change, they literally alert us and they, they let us know and they even bring back maybe some recommendations, you know, different ways that we can address that as far as language. Um, and then, like I said, we have department practices that, that fall underneath that. Um, so I'm happy to certainly try to address them. Um, we, and I, when I point this out, there was even maybe some talk. I, there's no reason to, I, I'm not defensive about, about this. I mean, I, I think having policies, having the community involved with it, I actually, I'm actually thrilled that people are interested in our policies and willing to kind of help go through it because they're meant to be fluid documents fluid in the sense that there's a process for us to change them. We don't, you know, we don't just change them with, you know, put it on the computer and, and start typing because that wouldn't be well thought out. I mean, there's a, there's a process. So, but, it, but I do appreciate, um, you know, people willing to kind of help us, um, maybe even some critical thinking and making sure that it, it best serves us. Um, but realistically, this day and age, as soon as a policy's adopted, um, it's almost, um, you almost have to change it again because it, it's everything's really changing fast. It's it becomes outdated very fast. So when we talk, when I'm going to be going through this, and the reason I'm kind of giving that intro is we're going to be talking in in pretty general terms, and a lot of things will kind of go back to the same same reasoning. Um, so the Lexapol, the, the kind of if you just think of it as as a framework. Um, it's it's designed to provide solidarity, um, similar language nationwide, statewide, and, and especially within Minnesota. Um, and some of their, their language doesn't always fit from what, from my experience, it's, it, it kind of references like we're a much larger agency. And it's, you know, when, when we first got this introduced to us, they, they explain that. You're, you're gonna notice some changes. And what they suggest is that we get together and that you, you, know, you thoroughly review that, and, and we have. We have our leadership team, which is myself, uh, Commander Barstead, and then our sergeants that literally had workshops, and we went over literally line by line, word by word, and we went through it to make sure it was the best fit for, for our department. So a lot, of the, a lot of the language when I'd gotten that email from, from you, Casey, and that's, I'm gonna, when I go through this, I'm gonna literally go, line by line on that and try to address that. But I think there was maybe um, thoughts that they certainly had our policies when they were doing this, but, but most, of, most of what I'm noticing, it's because there was, um, it's like, kind of like the Lexapol language, like maybe some, some recommendations. And when, they, and when they talk about recommendations, maybe that's even a strong word. They're just, they just want you to have some thoughts on a certain subject. And then you know, making sure it's the right fit for, for your department. So when you saw like that, that red language, you know, like it was written in, in red font, um, we had provided some of the changes. And, and again, it wasn't necessarily that we're changing policy from what we had before, because what we had before is very outdated, but rather that we were changing um, kind of what Lexapol, like we, we just didn't think Lexapol's language applied to our department. So I'll just um, kind of get going to the first one. So the, the first one that we talked about or that was shared on this was use of force analysis, and that would fall under 330.9.
Um, and then just some notes on here, appears to have an annual review of the use of force submitted to the chief, which includes training and policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this is probably language for a bigger department, because literally whenever we have a use of force situation and you know we're a small agency, we take them serious and we literally go through that that review immediately, case by case. So we didn't we didn't feel that that language was applied because you know if, if we're going to have that in there, we always if you have a policy, you want to follow it. And we just didn't feel it was was realistic for that reason because again, when we have literally any situation we have, we we address it real time. Um, and then and then as far as use of force specifically, we review, we review that quarterly. So like, if there's something that we feel, and we always have, if we feel that there's something that needs to be addressed, um, maybe some, some changes. If, you know, I mean, if they change something, like you can imagine everything that went on in, up in the cities, if they said, okay, officers to carry tasers, you have to do this, of course our policies change immediately. You know, we can't, we can't wait, we can't wait for you know, the, the quarter to come up where we talk about it. It has to be changed real time. And that's, that's usually, pushed out, governed by the post board. And post board is Peace Officer Standard and Training Board. Realistically, that's who licenses us. We can't be licensed officers unless they say so. Realistically, unless we're complying with their, their directives. Um, so like anything like with that, if there's, there's a change, it's generally coming through post board and it's pushed out and it's put into effect almost immediately. Um, the other thing that came up was taser device form. Um, said removal of periodic review of taser usage and information from review being shared with the public. Um, kind of on that same, same point, um, the information is likely available by request. So if anybody would wanna request and, and look at it, even this board, if you'd like to see what we, we have for the, the quarter for the year for taser use, I'd be happy to provide that. And then we can discuss it. Most, <coughs> most everything in there would be public information. The only thing would be is if we have a case that's, I, and I would still be able to provide the, the, the stat, I, but I may not be able to elaborate on a whole lot if, if we have a case that's, that's pending. That's still, and when we say under investigation, and you'll sometimes see that in the language, and I'm looking at Dan Kalk because you're very familiar with this, a case is under investigation until basically it runs through the court system. So when, when we're talking about like a under investigation, it doesn't mean that we're still trying to pick up leads and following through on it, but it just means that it's not available to the public. Um, it goes through a discovery process, but realistically, anything that we share with the public, we always get permission from the prosecutor to make sure that um, all the appeal processes have run out and that, and that we're just in, in compliance with the law. So again, that, that sounds technical, but when you hear like something in our policy, if it says investigation, it doesn't just mean that my staff is still actively working on it. It might be going through the, the court process. Um, so the taser um, devices, you know, we'd certainly be, be willing to, to talk about that um, if there's something that you'd wanna have, have shared. Um, and then the other one is administrative investigating um, under 305.7. So it says use of force in incidents switching from being reviewed by review board to being reviewed by the chief. Um, that was that was some recommendations or, or some language that uh, that Lexapol had had brought up. Realistically, it pretty much has to be reviewed by me. First of all, we don't have a review board. There there isn't one. Um, the closest thing that we would have to a review board that I think would be applicable would be our police commission, and that's essentially um, the mayor and then uh, two other commissioners. So, I mean, we, we could go in front of the review board, but as far as accountability, um, the post board will realistically only talk to the CLEO, which is the chief law enforcement officer. And the reason for that is they can, if I don't give them the satisfactory answer to the questions or make sure that we're in compliance, they can take action on my, my license, even if it's, I wasn't directly involved because it could be another licensed officer, but I'm, I'm responsible. To be a, to be a CLEO, you have to be a licensed officer. It's just, it's just a requirement. Um, it's because the post board can take action on your, on your license. Um, so again, the review, review board, we took out that 
that language just again because we don't we don't have one um, and that's something that we're willing to certainly talk about and work out but um it would have to be I would think maybe in a workshop or something like that and we'd have to get some ideas because we don't we don't want to just form one and again realistically likely it would be the police commission um, I think I explain all of that so the other thing is firearms training and qualification 306.6 .6. it said switching on-duty qualifications training to annually and then off-duty qualifications from twice per year to annually so with that so on duty off duty so we have to qualify with both our our service weapon anything that we're carrying it so it could be um, a firearm any rifle that we have access to any shotgun we have to qualify with that on an annual basis and that's again that's required by post board anything that's when they talk about off duty um, what they're referring to there is basically we're allowed to carry off duty with with a gun the, the only the only weapon we can't carry is our on duty weapon if we're carrying our on duty weapon it means we're on duty it does you know we can we don't necessarily have to be in a uniform or something like that I'm, I'm in plain clothes today I have a gun on <laughs> but I'm, I'm working if it's off duty we we the Minnesota um, post board requires that we do that on an annual basis we don't do it more than that just simply because it's required to be annually we we have and just to explain a little bit further, we have workshops that we go through. So when we have an annual qualification, um, we, and we actually qualify twice a year, but one of them is the one that we report to the post board, and it's generally the one in fall. The only exception to that would be, so it isn't just when you have a higher score that we provide that to the post board and the other one we forget about, but we, we, everything is recorded, and post board is very well aware of how we're doing it, which is very common with other departments. So we have, we have one for record, and then the other one is basically a makeup. So if an officer can't, can't make it for some reason, they have COVID or something like that, you know, we, we literally will go out with them and we'll qualify them. But if they would have, um, let's just say they're on, on long term, they're, they, couldn't make, they couldn't make it for months or something like that. There's a conflict, we get into winter. Then realistically, the other one would qualify for, the, for their annual qualification. And, Yes. No, Dave, I was just say I think their question was regarding like the, the next couple are all about training stuff. Yeah. Um, so would you say that in all those comments that those are all getting, putting us in line, putting our department in line with the post board requirements? Yes. So we, we're, that's, I mean, that's, that would that explain, because we were, we noticed some um, reduction and we were wondering, okay, in this age, so we're just in line with the rest of the police departments now. Pretty close. There, there are some larger departments that probably qualify more often. At least they have qualification probably quarterly because they're a larger agency. They have range officers. That's all they do. Right. But they, they and even in those cases, what they're reporting to post board, I'm confident, is just annual. Okay. So and just to clarify a little bit, I don't have that in front of me from last time, but I thought that the way it read was that it was decreasing the amount that you guys qualified, but is that not? It's not. That's not. No, okay. that, that was just recommended or, you know, suggest, suggestions that, the, that Flexipol okay. had offered. Because so it wasn't changing your no. policy to be okay. less of yep. a... It's, it's been that way at least for the last 30 years. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, and then bias-based um, policing administration, um, removal of annual review of the department by commander and submission of the report to the chief, including public concerns and complaints. And again, it's similar to that other point we take care of that real time um, and then report appears to have been used to guide future policy and training um, yeah that's that's certainly possible and again we didn't have that as a former policy but rather that that's the suggested language or recommended language um, and our you know I guess my comments that I had when I was going through this I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything we've Consider that possibly outdated language or just not applicable language for our department. And again, any complaint has been handled by the post board and, and post board alone. So if we have a complaint with, like there's a report of bias, I'm required to report that as of 2021. I always had to report it, but I'm, you know, I, I would have, there was like no time clock on me. 
like literally now the stopwatch is on. I have to report that like immediately to the post board. There's even a dedicated site that, a uh, website that I have to go on, on to, to to do it. Only the clay or whoever I appoint um, in my absence, like I'm leaving on vacation now, I have to make sure that the post board knows if I was gone, who would be reporting to them? Because if I'm, if I'm out of the state, I'm out of the state. So that's, that's just handled real time and that's handled literally by the post board. And that's part of the Police Reform Act. Um, there's, there's a lot of changes coming. So that was, I mean, it's a very good point, but that was the reason that we purposely had different language in there because we want to be in compliance with the post board. Um, and then one other point is it says about personnel records, removal of statement that adverse comments such as supervisor notes may be retained in file. Um, everybody has maybe a little, when we're doing that, we're always figuring, okay, what do they mean by supervisor notes in that particular situation? So how we handle supervisor notes, we have them. So if an officer has a report on another officer and they're just saying, you know, that officer um, wore an improper rain jacket, that's, that's one that's come up or something like that. They're generally relatively small, but things that we want to address. Um, the uniform looked dirty, things like that. We, we address that immediately. So if I get a supervisor note, I, I can only, I'm only allowed to retain it for a year. And that's not my rule, that's, that's just a, a requirement. Um, and all our, our officers are union. So a note really has to be a note. It can't be like a, a backdoor version of discipline. And if, if a, so if I get a supervisor note and it's serious, it, or it's, it's, all of them are, you know, we look at and we consider them serious. But if we have something minor, usually I'll just say, okay, you got to bring your, your uniform up to standard. And I gave, I gave that as an example. Or wear the correct rain jacket that says, no, I'm police department on it versus, you know, the pink one that you found in your car or whatever. Because we, we have that stuff happen. Um, that's not something that's going to result in discipline. If I actually... It's my responsibility if, if there's something that's serious that, that's, that's more, you know, like it, um, you, use of force, you use too much force in an incident, or um, the individual didn't have their radio on, their portable radio, and they, we weren't able to uh, communicate with them. That's serious. So in a situation like that, we handle it's called Appendix H, and that's, that's basically formal discipline. So... Anything, a supervisor note would never be in the personnel file. As far as retention, and I'm actually covering the next one, talks about retention and purging of the personnel file. We have no control of that. And I think most people would, Human Rights Commission would probably applaud that or certainly support it. I can't, I can't just go there and say, you know what, I'm going to look out for officer so-and-so because they have himself in a jam, and we're going to have the media coming. I, I, I have no control of that. It's all controlled by HR. And um, so whenever I have like Appendix H, if it's approved, HR has complete control of that. And that's, and that's permanently in your personnel file. So if it's a remove, from my experience, it's only by, and I've never seen this happen, but certainly the court could give direction for having something removed. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's, it's in there permanently. We don't hold anything for a year or five years. I've heard that from other departments. We've never done that. It's, it's permanent. But again, a supervisor note, just wouldn't meet that threshold, usually. It, but it would, it would have to be connected with formal discipline, Appendix H. So I don't know if that answers. I, I think that answers our questions, right, and that's, for most of us? That's all, I, that's all I had as far sure. as notes, unless there's anything else. No, I think we're good. Thank I you, I really Dave. appreciate you taking the time yep. to clarify oh. and provide that information. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you, you know, if you really wanted to have a workshop or something like that, I'd be very open to that. And then we could like maybe dive into some real specifics. Just in the interest of time, I've taken up a lot of time already. But it, you know, it's, it's necessary that we go through because these were the things that were presented. But um, you know, because literally, like one policy can take us hours. Because you know, we're researching it. We have the city attorney involved. We have sometimes the League of Minnesota Cities, sometimes the post board. As far as like researching it, so we can um, we take it serious. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Okay, moving through the agenda quickly, uh, uh, Casey, you added a note from the 118 City Council meeting. Yeah, the only thing that seemed maybe related to human rights was uh, law enforcement. They got a grant for, I believe, $300,000 just to support violent crime. 
So that seemed like something that was Good. relevant to human rights. There you go. Okay. I'm going to go back up then quickly to the uh, executive committee report, and I'm going to combine it with 12.2, which is the annual re review of mission statement. If you go to their mission statement, in our January meeting, we are to review our mission statement just to keep us in mind what we're doing. I'll read it out loud. To secure for all individuals equal opportunity to employment, housing, public accommodations, public service, and education, and to secure full participation in the affairs of this community by assisting the State Department of Human Rights and by advising the city on long-range programs to improve human relations in the city. That's the mission statement. The executive committee annually is to review the bylaws, and if you go to the bylaws document, we had just updated them last year for the first time in 26 years. So now we are um, um, going to suggest one update. And as, if you look at the very end, guidelines for the selection of candidates, all we added was a clarifying note. I'll read it. The current um, bylaw states, the individual acknowledges the need and potential for strong human rights protection assured through the Minnesota Human Rights Law. That's how it read previously. We added, which prohibits discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, public services, education, credit, and business based on protected class, such as race, religion, disability, national origin, sex, marital status, familial status, age, sexual orientation, and gender identity, period. That is highlighted in yellow. Uh, by law, by our following our own bylaws, we need to provide a written notice of that. This meeting is the written notice of that change, and we will vote on that at our next meeting in February. Any questions? Okay. One more item on the agenda. Two more, actually. Uh, other business 12-1 is the Summary of the Sex Trafficking Awareness Seminar, which we co-hosted um, last week. Um, I know I was in attendance. There were a couple of people here who were in attendance. I know there were over 120 people there. I thought, I counted, got an official estimate. Um, pretty good turnout for a cold night. Were there any comments on that? I have, I have one, uh, Mr. Chair. I was gonna, I'm going to bring this down. So uh, I'll preface my comments with I, I was not there. I was not able to make it. But I did speak with uh, a community member today who is not part of this commission, just a, an individual uh, expressed some serious concern about um, an anti-LGBT slant that was, um, that was given during the... Um, during the presentation, uh, the word that she used was uh, appalled at some of the phrasing and words and even more appalled at the uh, audience reaction uh, to that as apparently there was a lot of applause uh, to those comments. And so, um, again, I was not there. I am passing along what someone uh, talked to me about, but it certainly seems like um, we have a ways to go based on what I heard. I heard similar sentiments from individuals that were there. And I just, I, I think that there was a lot of really good information that was presented from what I understand. Right. It was, it's a very important topic, obviously. That's why we supported it as a commission. Right. And I believe the comment was in a question and answer period. It was kind of an offhand comment regarding, it wasn't part of her official presentation. Um, but yeah. Any other comments? So we were deciding on whether we should respond to that or not publicly. I do think that given that we were co-sponsors, and even if we were not co-sponsors of it, the fact that a comment like that was made in a public forum, I do think it would be worth responding as a commission. I think, too, to Casey's point, that there was good information, and I think we can phrase it in a way that we support the education and the information, but do not support the statements that were made. The personal message. The personal messaging, correct. I believe she was stating a personal opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what do you wish to do? I just have a point of information. I was not able to attend. But it just seems to me, I don't know what she said in a in her personal comments. <clears throat> However, it would seem to me, is there any vetting process that we do as a commission when we have somebody that's going to speak on a topic that we're endorsing? It seems odd to me that we would maybe not research the person and what comments they might be making to make sure that they are in line with our own stated mission. I believe I Chief Borchert may have a comment on this. Well, the police department, was, we were co-hosts. So like the last meeting I had come in front of this board and asked if, you know, if you were willing to um, provide maybe some funding for this because it was advertising, just everything with, with small budgets. It's, it's always helpful mm -hmm. if we can work together. And you know, as far as the, the vetting, we've used her before. And, and we co-sponsored before too, correct, Jackie? I, yeah, yeah. yeah, 2015 we co-sponsored. Yeah. I don't know if you're co-sponsors or not. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I remember you being involved. I just, you know, formally, I don't know if you were a co-host or not, but I'm not, I'm certainly not disputing that. Um, we used her before, and I mean, I noticed some of her language, some of her um, positions maybe have changed slightly. Overall, I think like 85 to 90 percent of it was exactly the same. So we had used her before, as like as far as the the vetting. Um, she hasn't, she wasn't involved um, in the speaking circuit at all during COVID, and she even shared that during her her um, opening remarks. Um, from my standpoint, if I would have, you know, again, now this is all opinion, but if I would have noticed something that I thought was, if you would have said, you know, I'm against so-and-so or against these individuals, I would have politely handled it right there. Mm -hmm. She was stating her own personal opinion. In fact, she, she just said, you know, this is, my, this is my personal opinion. I think she even said, I know sometimes this has gotten me in trouble because I have an opinion, but she was, she never, there was nothing threatening. There was nothing where she was degrading or anything no, like that. No. She offered an opinion. I don't know if it completely agreed with other people's, right. but um, it, you know, even the nature, and I don't know if you've been able to watch the recording. Um, I would in, encourage you to take a look at the recording because again, it, I didn't see anything, not that it has to be mean-spirited, but there was nothing mean-spirited. She was, she was just offering an opinion. Probably what got most people upset was the audience reaction to her comments, is what I'm gathering. Right. Terry, you were there, right? Uh, yeah. Offering an opinion, so, yeah. you know, that would be like me at my first meeting here, offering my opinion on something that perhaps was bigoted in a way that should not be when, you know, I'm told to read this package to prepare me for being a member of this commission, I find it very unnerving to hear that that's what happened in it, whether it's her personal opinion or not, I guess. Because her if it's not in line with our mission statement, then it's odd to me that we're going to say, well, you know, that's okay. Well, there's a lot of things that we could say that's okay to that really aren't okay because look how your audience is responding to it. So are we saying we endorse, you know, people's personal opinion? Actually, what I was told to read to come to this meeting was that, you know, we're, we're trying to support, you know, all people's thoughts and be all inclusive. And whether or not we carry, we all carry our own personal opinions on a lot of different things. But I just, I don't know. I might be saying too much for my first meeting already. It just strikes me the wrong way, and I always have a hard time holding my tongue. But that's all I have to say about it. I, I think, though, in, in that situation, you know, short of censoring someone, yeah. um, I, I mean, she's offering an opinion, and what she was there to provide, you know, she may not have even know who, who was sponsoring it. And I don't know if that really completely matters, but she... Right. You know, her thing was she knew who, as far as the contacts, that it was 
the police department and the city, because I think, Jackie, you, you talked with her prior to, I don't know how you identified yourself, but you know, certainly that it was a city commission that was involved. You know, I think she's thinking city of New Ulm. Um, I, again, I don't know what's going through her, her thoughts. I don't know, you know the back introductions or anything like that. Um, but you know, even in, in the context of what she said, she offered and said that she felt that individuals in certain communities were even more vulnerable. And, and she's explaining, because the one thing that she has that I think most of us in this room don't is that she's a survivor of human trafficking. I mean, she, she literally lived it. So she's offering, we might not agree with everything that she said, or certain people might not agree with what, what she said, but she's offering her opinion from, from her experiences, which is what she realistically is getting paid to do. Well, and I agree. I think that it sounds like there were some really great takeaways from this, and I don't think it's anyone's fault that this speaker, there no no way of knowing, and it sounds like she provided great information on the topic. However, there was a comment that was made, and I think it would be fair as a Human Rights Commission, whether or not we were involved in it, to issue a statement saying we do not agree with her personal opinion. However, we appreciate the information that was provided for the topic at hand. I agree because I just feel like it just gives the impression that we support the opinion, even though we we didn't know, you know, it's her own personal opinion and she has a right to that. But I just feel like if we don't say something, it gives the impression that we're supporting her personal opinion. And as a human rights commission, I just feel like we don't want to give the impression that we're supporting that kind of discrimination. Are you making a motion, either one of you? Yes, I will make a motion that we form a response and the form of a letter to the editor. I would second that. Stating what you suggested in the comments about the... About supporting this, the, yeah. the education, the information about sex trafficking, and just mentioning that we do not support her personal opinions. Okay. Any discussion on that? Would that be via the Public Relations Committee, I, I assume? Yes. yes. Yeah. I would discussion? second that motion. Oh. What? Second. Yeah, I think, yeah, I assume that. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Same sign. Motion passes. We'll refer that to the Public Relations Committee. Designate okay. that. Aye. Thank you. Can I ask who else is on the Public Relations Committee with me now? I will, I will take care of that after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that brings us to the end of our agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to go back up. Uh, we have one more item on the agenda, and that's to present our 2021 uh, New Ulm Human Rights Commission uh, Award, Human Rights Award. Uh, we have two former Human Rights Commission members who were just recently, terms were up, Tim Frenig and Jackie Crabile, who are going to present the award for us at the podium. everybody. I'm Jackie Cable. I'm Tim Frenning. And first I'd like to thank the commission for inviting us back to take part in tonight's event. Um, Dave, I think of you as a confidant, a mentor, and most importantly a friend. And I am honored tonight to be able to take part in awarding you the 2021 New Ulm Human Rights Commission Human Rights Award. <coughs> Um, New Home Human Rights Commission has named New Home Police Chief Dave Borkert as its 2021 Human Rights Award recipient. Um, Chief Borkert has initiated input from the HRC on innovative programs um, like body cameras, traffic awareness seminars, and mental health calls. Uh, immediately after the George Floyd tragedy, Borkert communicated to the community his insurance that New Ulm Police Department training regiment did not include chokeholds. Borker does also co-sign letters with the HRC to minimize tensions between law enforcement and local communities of color. Um, in other ways, Borker instituted the Coffee with the Cop program. He serves as a co-organizer of the local National Night Out program, participates in One New Alms Family Table program, is also a member of the Minnesota River Valley Mentoring Team, um, serving as a mentor for homeless um, and assists returning citizens in gaining driver's licenses and car insurance. In both his personal and professional lives, Chief Borker promotes and protects human dignity and the rights of all. Can we have him come up? 
do we want to have the entire group come up no, so there's, there's, we can yeah. get a picture all at the same time? We can time? do that afterwards. We're good. We're good. All right. Do we want to do it up front? No, we'll do it right there. It's fine. I think it's on camera. <laughs> Dave, I'm honored. We are honored. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate that. I've been up here a lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to just start off by thanking everyone. Um, I thank you, everyone, that um, joined me in, in attending tonight's meeting. A special thank you to my wife. Um, <laughs> I always make sure to do that. I even have it written down so I don't miss it <laughs> mistakenly because <laughs> it's not intentional if I do. But, but thank you, everyone, for the support, and thank you, Carrie, for, for joining us and, and supporting me. Um, I'd also like to thank the Human Rights Commission um, for the prestigious award. Sometimes, like in law enforcement, you know, not that many communities you would have the Human Rights Commission and law enforcement working side by side and having these discussions and literally even recognizing each other. Um, so I, I think that that really shows a, a value to the community. Um, your important role that you provide. And law enforcement, I'm, I'm proud of the profession, and I think we work together very well to, to serve our community. And we really are all looking out for individuals' human rights and um, trying to protect people and, and serve them. Um, far as, <clears throat> as far as lessons learned, um, you know, oftentimes you hear about the best lessons learned I learned in kindergarten. <laughs> um, as far as treating people as you want to be treated, being fair, um, looking out for others. Several professions do this, and it's not just limited law enforcement. And, um, but I, I believe it also includes law enforcement. And that's, that was one of the primary reasons that I, I was involved in. in when I, you know, if you'd asked me why I got involved in law enforcement, it's because I literally wanted to help people. And that, that was the motivating factor. I'm a first-generation cop. So it wasn't like something that was passed down where it's just like, and sometimes you see that it's like, you know, while well, I'm serving because my dad, grandpa, and great-grandfather were in law enforcement. I'm first generation. In fact, I don't know of anybody in my family that's ever served in law enforcement. So I didn't come from that, that background. Um, as far as one thing, they always talk about pivotal moments that you have in life. Um, one, one moment, a couple of moments that I'm going to share both of them happened when I was in school. So um, I've had the luxury where I've been able to have the good fortune where I've had advanced education, um, been able to go to graduate school, learn another language, you know, a lot of things, been in the military. And I, I think all of them kind of like reinforce and you, you draw from those experiences. But some of the main lessons that I learned literally happened when I was in kindergarten and um, in ninth grade. And I think I can take this off. I, I don't want to muffle up my speech. Um, when I, I haven't shared that with probably a, necessarily a whole lot of people because it doesn't come up. But when I was, I had a hard time talking when I was in, in kindergarten. Literally, um, I, had a, I had an issue. I literally couldn't speak. And at that time, you can imagine, you go back to, um, you know, early 70s. I, I grew up in Winthrop. There's not a whole lot of resources available. And literally, I had a, a after speech therapy, I was able to resolve the situation, like literally after six months of speech therapy, because back then they, we didn't have a speech therapist in, in Winthrop. And there was another child that was having kind of the same or similar type of, of issues. And literally, they were able to get a grant secure some funding and get a speech therapist. And I was, I was on, on track, like literally with six months of, of speech therapy. So, um, and then my parents, so I said after that, I literally went from not talking at all till they couldn't shut me up. <laughs> but, but literally within six months, I was, I was speaking okay. But I remember a situation, um, there was my neighbors, they had a, on their refrigerator, they had a, Peanuts character was Snoopy sleeping on top of a doghouse, and I always admired that. I, I you know, I, Sally Bruss was her name, Sally and Wilbur, and I and I would always, you know, like 
look at that and I always wanted to touch it and, and things like that. And I was just really interested in that. Well, one day um, Sally had apparently said to Wilbur, you know, we're kind of changing our design here. Um, it, for whatever reason, it's like I'd like to take that down and Dave really likes it, so let's, let's give it to him. So literally when they, they took it, they got in the car and I was always playing outside. Maybe they even looked out the window. I can't re remember what they had said later. But they saw me, I believe they saw me playing. And they, when they drove around to take off wherever they were going, they stopped on the, on the corner. And we lived on the corner. We just lived two houses down from them. And they called me over to the car and they said, here, this is, this is a gift. We know you like it. Enjoy it. So I was excited about that and went running inside the house to show my mom and dad. Um, it was just, I believe, just my mom um, But at that point. But anyhow, I showed my parents what I had gotten, and she had concerns because she said, where did you get that from? And I said, well, I, I couldn't talk. I, and, you know, she, moms and parents have a better ability to communicate with someone in situations like that, but I literally couldn't articulate where I got it from. So she says, well, show me. So well, I took her out to the corner, and I'm like, well, like right here. And she's like, well, you didn't get it from a storm sewer. <laughs> and she had concerns that I had taken it, that I had stole it. And I, you know, literally I can remember that. My parents were always very supportive, but they were, they were concerned. And that's um, basically like having a disability. I kind of remember how I was treated by some people, and I remember some of those challenges. So I think as far as like in law enforcement, that's always been kind of a takeaway and something that I've really, um, when I'm serving people, I, I just keep in mind. The other thing is, I don't, I don't know if you remember what you're doing in 1984. Some of you might not even been alive yet, but <laughs> I, was a, I was a ninth grader at MVL. And I, I point that out because um, there was a crime that was going on in, at, when I was a freshman. Someone had stole band instruments from the band kids. And I, I was in band, kind of. I mean, I wasn't a very, really good at the trombone, but my instrument hadn't been taken. It's, you know, trombones are large. But there, there was a theft that was going on. And law, or local police out there, and that's in Nicollet County, um, law enforcement, and, and this has, had been reported publicly to, to all the students, and um, school administration, they had a theory on, on what happened. Um, I was in band. I saw how those kids, like some of those kids were crying because they probably couldn't afford to buy another instrument. Um, and I, it was kind of a takeaway, and I'm like, you know, I, I don't, my theory doesn't agree with the school administrations right now. I, I think that I have an idea who maybe possibly did this. And because I had noticed some kids acting suspicious, hanging in a certain area, area of the school. Um, and I, you know, they didn't get real defensive around me because I'm just a student, just a freshman. Um, and these were older classmen. But I, I remember um, after school, we always had to take a bus back to, to Winthrop into the surrounding areas. I took it upon myself to just do some research, and I, I found the instruments. <laughs> and once I found them, I'm like, okay, now what do I do with this? Because back then, especially when you're in school, and I had come from a public school. MVL was the first year I'd gone to a parochial school. Um, I certainly didn't you know, grow up in East LA or anything like that. It was Winthrop High School. But we never, one big thing in school is that you never narc, you never, you never tattle. So I was in a situation, I wanted these kids to get their, their instruments. I was concerned with um, telling administration, looking back, that's probably what I should have done. But I literally remember taking the instruments back, putting them in, in a duffel bag, and putting them back where they belonged, um, and got away with it. And I often thought if I would have, because I, I had a big duffel bag that I was carrying, like you would for sports. And I often thought if I would, and I had to take like two, three trips, if I would have gotten caught doing that, or if someone would have even seen me do it, likely they would have thought I stole the instruments and 
I had cold feet and I was returning them. Um, it got, so that was always the, the first crime that I got, so, that I was able to solve. Um, <laughs> in, in law enforcement, you know, we, when you're doing investigations, investigations was always one thing that I was probably the, everything you do in law enforcement is usually some type of investigation. It might be just a vehicle stop or it might be something extremely serious, a, a serious felony, but they're all investigations. And you start off in law enforcement with having a theory and then you start closing in and you reinforce your theory or maybe develop another one. Um, one thing that this really taught me is, and again, the school, I know the school principal knew that I had returned them because when they kicked out a couple of the kids, they, they thought, they said, I don't know who, who took it, um, put, put them back, but we didn't. We stole them, we didn't return them. And they were just kind of, it's almost like they were proffering. Proffering is a, a legal term where you're giving up everything because there's no consequence. I, I believe that's what the principal, Mr. Burkholz, had, had possibly done with them. But Burkholz told me himself that, because um, there was some, he had brought that to my, my I had some issues, um, probably some, some things that I had done that were, were improper. And when Burkholz had told me, he had, he had just shared, he goes, I, you're good natured. He goes, I, I think you're honest. And he shared that story with me. And, and we had a conversation, and that was the end of it. Um, but what, what it really reinforced is that sometimes law enforcement theories are just theories of a, as far as an investigation are wrong. You have the wrong person. You have to reevaluate. Um, and I, I find that sometimes in law enforcement, I think you, there's people, I think it's maybe even human nature, but you get caught into something. No one wants to be wrong. And you keep putting energy into proving something that's you're proving your theory rather than the crime. So that was always my takeaway. Something that you know I, I use to this very day when I'm scrutinizing or, or looking at reports. Because it's my job to say, you know, I don't know if you're on the right track here. Or at the very minimum, I think you might want to reevaluate some, you know, look at some different options, look at some um, possibly some, some different theories on it. Um, so just in the interest of time, um, I, I just want to kind of summarize by just saying sometimes the theories are wrong, um, and I, I provide that that kindergarten in incident where my mom, who was, was always very supportive, but her theory of what happened with me, you know, getting Snoopy was different from what reality was, um, and also the MVL story. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to just address, and I think all of you are part of this, is people need resources. So. Um, in my situation, it was speech therapy. Um, other things, you know, like defense attorneys. Sometimes when you have individuals that you get caught up in something, um, they're not the law enforcement enemy. They're, they're a resource for, for individuals. That's, it's part of the, the Constitution, essentially. Um, things like drug court. I think that, you know, there's no one grows up. They don't want to, you know, when they're young, they don't say, you know, when I'm older, I really want to become a drug addict and live a life of crime. You don't do that when you're in first, second grade, or realistically any time. It just, it happens, and they need resources to get on the right track. So I've, I, that's not a law enforcement enemy. I know we have people on drug court, and they've asked me, you know, why do you support something like that? Well, because we, as a community, we want to survive, and we want to give people resources. And I, I think it's a very good thing. So, um, and like I said, some of those personal experiences, I think, um, were kind of driving forces in kind of establishing that, that feeling or that opinion for me. Um, and then um, as far as, you know, one other thing that I like to really do is, um, and that I kind of have a reputation with, in fact, one of the, our officers just retired and had commented about that and just said, you know, thanks for always looking out for the underdog. So um, I'd like to just, again, reinforce, I, I appreciate this prestigious award. Um, New Alm's a very good community. I enjoy serving it, and thank you. That brings an end to our meeting, official meeting for tonight. Uh, just a note that our next meeting is February 28th, our reg regular scheduled meeting of next month. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn our meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign.
Thank you all for coming. There are treats and drinks out.